Friday meeting for ACNC. Uh, let's get started. So first of all, you're being recorded. We record all of our meetings. Um, slides, recordings, and other resources will be available at acnuc.org slash archive following meetings. Um, make sure you fill out our attendance form if you're here because that is how we uh, determine how much pizza to order and it's also how we determine who gets voting rights at the end of the year. Um, so make sure you fill it out at the link above. So for those of you who are new, what is ACM at UC? Well, ACM at UC is a group of students built around a common interest in computers. We host workshops, uh, tech talks, hackathons, all kinds of events, and all majors are welcome as long as you're interested in computers. We have a code of conduct. Um, you can find it on our website at acmuc.org slash conduct. Um, and we also follow the UC code of conduct. So if you have any questions about what constitutes good behavior, they're all outlined there. Um, we offer academic services, so we do review uh, sessions uh, for programming concepts in C++ and data structures. Um, we do, you have past talks of that on YouTube, or you can wait for uh, us to do that this year um, to show up those. Uh, we have office hours um, in row data 2A, from Monday through 30 to 4.30 p.m. and Thursday to 3 p.m. Um, stop by those at any time, come talk to us, ask for help with homework, uh, what we'll be hanging out there. Um, ICPC, the International Collegiate Programming Contest, is happening actually next weekend, um, October 25th to 26th. Um, there's still time to sign up. You're going to get into teams of about three people. Um, and work on some algorithmic uh, challenges. Um, so it's a very cool event. If you're interested, sign up on Slack, talk to me, or talk to Professor Franco um, for details. Um, Ohio Dev Fest, it's a big tech conference that's happening um, November 2nd on this. Um, we have five uh, free tickets that we're giving out, sponsored by Kroger Digital. So if you're interested in going, there's a form in the Slack. If you have any more questions about it, you can ask Maggie or message her on Slack. Um, speaking of Slack, uh, Slack is the best way to get in contact with us at ACM. We post all kinds of things, um, plus there's lots of people who like to hang out there and talk about um, you know, relevant articles and other random stuff. So it's a great place to be um, if you're interested in uh, hearing everything that goes on in the community. All right, so that brings us to our talk for today. Um, I'd like to introduce Michael Clark from Predator Digital. He's going to talk about the dates of inspiring tech for the year. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. So, actually, I'm just some guy that I you know, found walking down the road and said, hey, you want to do a talk? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll pretend for a couple. <laughs> so, um, actually, so I. Uh, an employee of Kroger, wearing my Kroger shirt today. Um, I've been with Kroger Digital uh, about eight years now, going on. Um, I was one of like the first 50 people uh, in Kroger Digital. I uh, started as a uh, services developer for them, then switched to did Android mobile for about four or five years. Um, then became a mobile services lead, and then now a software engineering manager over the mobile team. So I've done lots of hiring uh, and being that kind of uh, technical mentorship type of role uh, for the last couple of years officially. In the meantime, I was also getting my own education at uh, NKU, actually. I am an undergrad and master's from there, and then just never left and stayed on as an adjunct. And I've been adjuncting there for about four and a half years now, so I thought uh, Android, advanced Android, uh, software testing and maintenance, um, uh, advanced computing methods in C++, which is a weird, like, down bare metals type of, type of class, uh, elementary programming, and a couple other things. And so, um, yeah, like I said, four and a half years of, of doing that, so I've definitely, you know, had the professor hat on. Uh, a couple times. I've taught, I've, uh, not taught, I've done some talks at UC before for the other group that Maddie, can you help me, what was it? Um, it's, um, it's the IT version of us. Yes. Yeah. There's some long acronym that I can not remember. It was Mickey O. Um, somebody said that they were getting a Kroger executive in today. I'm not even close to a Kroger executive. Um, sorry to disappoint. I'm a first level manager, barely at that, so basically, a, you know, a little more than a nobody, but not much more than that. 
you want to see a real Kroger exec, get Brendan in a couple years. Uh, <laughs> he'll, he'll be there. He's interned so much, he'll come in at the VP level. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, so all that being said, we do a lot of internships with Kroger. Um, so I'm going to do my shameless plugs off at the beginning. Uh, a lot of great internships. We're always hiring if you're fresh, uh, fresh grads. Um, uh, seek me out or my peers. There's lots of opportunities. And then, of course, there's this thing coming up called Ohio Dev Fest. Um, this talk that I'm doing tonight is kind of a precursor to the keynote that I'm going to be giving there. So um, they, for some reason, chose me to do the keynote uh, because of my title, traits of an inspiring technical leader. Um, preparation is not one of those traits, apparently, because uh, <laughs> I'm not at all ready for that, and regardless of how many times I've been in front of people talking, I'm constantly always nervous, uh, butterflies in my stomach, and especially when it's recorded, uh, I feel even more awkward. So uh, tonight, I'm not going to give the keynote, um, I'm going to talk about all the same topics of the keynote, but the keynote's actually going to be designed more for the conference where there's a lot of working professionals and who may want to step up their game or just want to be better technical leaders. This talk, I'm going to kind of um, push it in a different direction. Uh, not just because I'm completely unprepared and um, all of that. <laughs> some laugh. This is a joke. Um, but um, also because tailoring it for students, um, there's a lot more questions that you may have. Um, and so I want to make it a little more personal and a lot less awkward for me standing up here talking into an echoing room. And so I definitely want to get a lot more interaction from the audience and uh, just you know, try to limit you know, the amount of pizza you eat while you ask me a question, you know, and find some sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I'm also kind of edgy. I thought about bringing in a laptop and doing the slides and all of that, but instead I'm actually just going to read from my phone and try to make it more of a, uh, yeah, I could have done this from my laptop. There's going to be all this awkward scrolling, which is going to do this. I'm a mobile guy. That's what I am. So, traits of an inspiring technical leader. The talk is going to be about how to build high performing teams, what you look for when hiring and developing talent as a technical lead, how do you evaluate that talent, uh, what do you do if you have someone on your team with an overinflated ego. This all more applies to folks who are already working or in the workforce somewhere. So, why don't I start? by asking the room, how much do you actually have work experience in the industry so far? Decent amount, and what is that work experience? Internships? And straw poll, what have your internships consisted of? And of course, Maddie and Brendan work with us at Mobile and Curl Digital, so I know what you're talking about, so other folks. Just off the home of the so what did what to describe like what a day was like? Um, most of it was uh, solving uh, some of the problems coming from support tickets um, from IDA, from the quality uh, from the support team, I guess. How many leaders did you interact with? That, and by leader, I don't necessarily mean manager. Leaders and managers are two different things. Certainly, managers should be leaders in some regards, but leaders can be other folks, tech leads, or just someone that's influential on the team. Um, usually two on a daily basis. Do you know what the difference is, uh, your own personal perception, between a good leader and maybe a not so good leader? Um, I, I suppose a good leader is you choose someone who's offering help to follow a task. They're not just expecting you to leave by the front, I suppose. That's what I say to leaders. So more of the, the, the mentorship. Role. So that's that's definitely one of the, the pillars that I want to touch on. Um, uh, someone else, uh, what's what's something that you've observed a leader, um, a good trait a leader doing? And Maddie, you and you feel free to jump in. Yeah. You don't have to use me. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the things that I've noticed So listens and then actually acts on that feedback and has yeah. some kind of action. Um, so how do you know 
if the leader is acted on that feedback or not. I mean, certainly there's, depending on what that action might be, there's a direct effect, but in many cases there might not be direct things that you can observe, so how might you know that? Well, a good leader would probably let you know that they're acting on that. Some form of communication, some yeah. form of follow-up. That in particular is something that is lost on a lot of uh, lots of leaders. That's a great example. Um, does anyone have an example of something that maybe a not so good leader has done or exhibited? Ooh, you should raise your hand. <laughs> um, I think one thing that separates a good leader from a bad leader is that a bad leader will not admit when they're wrong, and they'll try to you know, just always think that they're right because they're sort of in a leadership position, whereas good leaders admit when they're wrong even though they're in a leadership position above others. Good point. Um, so yeah, definitely not just not just the ego, but just the, the position of authority. I'm right because I'm in this position. Um, that, that's a good that's a good angle. Uh, anyone else work? Yeah, I've seen leaders being kind of a follow up to Brandon, but I've seen them being too stubborn to not realize if something cannot be done with the like amount of time or resources we have. Mm -hmm. So just just like. If you have something in mind, but it's not possible to be done, just give up on it. So, um, more is being asked than can be done in a certain time frame that the resources are given. So, uh, what that means is they don't have proper expectations set from some way, shape, or form. Right. Um, yeah. So actually, the first topic that I have is around uh, managing expectations. So that's, that actually is a great segue into it. So um, have any of you heard of under-promise and over-deliver? Yeah, that's, that's essentially what it is. So when we say managing expectations, um, it's, not just, uh, it's not just depending on your role. If you're a tech lead or if you're a manager, you have multiple sets of expectations that you have to set. So you have to set expectations with your employees on what your expectations are from uh, a given role or a given team. Uh, you're going to have peers that are going to be uh, dependent on you in different business units, uh, for example, depending on how large of an organization. If you're a smaller you know, startup or something like that, then you know, it's kind of more of a do or die type of situation, so that, that's going to be different. But I'm, I'm talking more in, in a, a medium to large size organization. Of course, I have further on my mind with some of this. But you're going to have peers, other other pieces of uh, <clears throat> functionality that are dependent on you or you're dependent on them, and so you have to have a good relationship and you have to manage the expectations for delivery that way. Uh, when, we man when we say manage expectations, I don't just mean um, asking uh, that, that peer, this is what I expect. It's also communicating and making sure that, that you know what is expected of you. And so it's, it's making sure you have that, that communication as a two-way street. So communication really is gonna be the, the, the key driver through a lot of the topics, through a lot of the foundation that, that we're talking about. But a uh, core piece that a lot of folks um, miss, especially new managers, um, or even tech leads, is they have no ability to manage up. You know what I mean by managing up? Anyone want to take a guess? <coughs> yeah? Is it being able to like, negotiate with the executives and explain what's going on? Yeah, I mean, it's essentially it's being able to have those conversations with the executives. But it doesn't have to be an executive. It doesn't have to be a VP or, or, or that high stakeholder. It can just be my direct manager, for example. Uh, he's a very busy person. Uh, he may not have all the full contact, context and awareness. And so I have to make sure that I'm proactive in giving him the, or her the information, in my case it's him, the information that is needed to make the decisions at, the, at his level that, that is needed. And so managing up is making sure that you communicate your expectations of what you expect from him clearly as well, or her in, in, in that situation. So uh, as an example, if we're talking about um, the hiring needs of a team, for example, uh, and that actually came up this week for me. And if I have a certain set of needs, 
uh, how does that person know what my needs are? Uh, they're going to come in and if they need to make a decision, they're going to use the best information that they have available at the time. So it's my job to manage up, and in other words, it's my job to make sure that his expectations are set, that my needs are met, and that I'm proactive with it, and that I don't just wait to be told what to do, that, that I'm proactive all the way up. And then if there's anything he needs to follow up on with his boss, and so on and so forth, uh, that's what we call managing up. And so that's something that, uh, especially new tech leads, new managers, uh, if they don't do it properly, they're not going to be able to have the type of relationship that they need to be effective and really gain the trust uh, of the team. So, um, managing expectations. Uh, has anyone ever been on a team or in a situation where expectations weren't properly managed? Any good examples? No, everyone's expectations are perfectly met. That's great. <laughs> okay, um, I'll try to do a hypothetical uh, on this one. I'm trying not to get too specific because this is recorded and certain people are going to know when I'm talking about them or not if they come back and watch this. And yeah, I don't hear me that book. Um, let's say you wanted to. Um, introduce um, a new language or a new process or a new technology um, to your team. Um, you as a technical leader uh, have, have not properly set the, the expectations needed for how that, that, that process uh, might go. So for example, they come to you and say, hey, there's this new, brand new, awesome thing that we should be doing that we need to look at, and it's going to be great, it's going to do all these things. And you as a leader, you're like, you don't want to discourage them. You want to say, yes, great, come on in, and we'll implement that, we'll do that, write up a, write up a, uh, um, a proposal, you know, do a proof of concept with your team, and, and handle it that way, and go off and do that. And that person goes off and does all the work, does all the things, you, being busy, you get about it. Uh, that person comes back two weeks later and says, "Here's my thing. When are we going to get it? Um, when are we going to use it?" And you look at it and you see it and you actually give it the uh, attention that's needed. And you might realize that um, this didn't meet some kind of uh, technical spec specifications, or for some reason there's a, it, it conflicts with another tool that's already out there. And so not having the proper uh, expectations met around what the process is for bringing in, for example, new technology, or not clearly, um, not clearly explaining or setting uh, the the tone of the conversation of, of how that person uh, is going to be interacting. They, in other words, their expectation was that they're going to be able to use this new thing. All they needed to do was go do the work. You asked them to go do work. They came back and did the work, so they should get the reward for it. In the real world, that's not necessarily how it might go. And so it, it's entirely possible that you have to say no. And if you haven't met that, if you haven't talked about the expectations with them, then you're going to cause disappointment, it's going to cause morale issues and things like that. Those types of situations come up all the time. And so that's something that, you know, the hypothetical that. Going out, it's not that that's ever specifically happening. Like that. Um, I'm getting as much interaction as I like. Any other questions around expectations? Any other? No. All right. Next. Time. Actually, a uh, question for you about expectations. So with you now being in a management position that you can set, uh, what are some of the techniques that you use to uh, set expectations for your team in a way that's understandable for everyone on the team? When you have a larger organization, more than four or five people, or a team, um, it's very important to make sure that um, 
there are the right uh, guidelines. I don't want to say the word process because process is kind of a negative connotation, but the right guidelines in place to um, to handle uh, how work is is to be set. So, for example, um, something like the tech radar process for uh, how to bring in new technology. Large organization, every new latest and greatest thing can't be brought in. Having a tech radar type of policy for uh, process, something that where you vet, or even if it's just uh, the merge request uh, uh, examples, um, you know, every every team may have their own idea of, you know, well, this is the way I prefer to do merge requests, but for for multiple teams trying to work together, or certain personalities. Um, may have stronger opinions than others. It's making sure that you can appropriately set how that conflict is going to be resolved and what that uh, what that process and what that what that guideline really is. Um, if it's if you mean expectations in terms of just work output, um, then that's Generally, setting like every team at Kroger, for example, has the direction of a product manager, and the product manager owns that product, owns that vision. I know you know absolutely nothing about this. Uh, owns that product, owns that vision. Um, so, aligning the folks to that vision and setting the expectation around how you're going to deliver against that. Um, for example, if it's not clear how uh, deliverables get met. It's not clear what process you're following. Hey, different versions of Agile or different definitions of done or all of these fun things. Everyone's not on the same page. Then, you know, how can you manage those uh, expectations on when things are delivered or how people are expected to work? All right, the word managing expect uh, words managing expectations is starting to lose all meaning to me. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, let's see. So talking a little bit about delivery of work. So one thing that a good technical leader uh, tries to help manage or tries to help uh, with any team, and this, again, a leader is anyone who helps influence someone else. So whether that's helping a product manager, helping a manager, being a manager, being a tech lead, um, one of the things that they do is help manage uh, work in process or scope, making sure that scope doesn't creep. You guys heard of scope creep before? All right, seems to head nods. All right, so I'm going to have another good topic. So scope creep. Uh, you want to have a good example of a time scope creep happened to them? Never? Ah, yeah. Um. <coughs>
who really managed the, the work? Was there a tech lead? Uh, yeah, so we had a tech lead and a business analyst. Okay, so you had a business analyst. Did they, did you, they're usually the one that helps you define that scope and define that, that story. Did they not see that, the, the scope? Uh, they weren't really involved in the planning of that certain fe scope fe feature. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really the tech lead thing, seeing the, it wasn't really a physical option moving forward to continue working on that. Gotcha. Um, any other examples of scope creep, scope, scope increases? Okay. Um, I have one where I, as a co-op, was asked to build a front end for a, a, an existing tool um, that another engineer had built. And so I started by you know, making front end, I was testing it, and I found a few bugs. And I ended up tracking them down and realizing that they were coming from the actual output that I was displaying. So there wasn't a bug in, in my code, was a bug in the tool. And so I went and talked to um, my manager, and it ended like a week later with me rewriting like large portions of the back end of that, mm -hmm. that tool. And so in that case, once again, so you actually were able to deliver in this case, but at the same time still derail the thing that you were supposed to work on. Um, was that a conversation with your manager that was just accepted that you're going to, the scope increase? So, yeah, I think it was part of it was um, that like I had talked to them about what it was and they had sort of said, okay, go fix it. Um, without, I don't know whether or not at the time they realized that that meant that I would have to go back into that whole other piece of code, but it kind of ended with reworking a lot of other stuff in the back, which kind of needed to be done anyway, but. So let me, let me take a step back. Does everyone know what I mean when I say scope creep? So you're working on a feature as part of, or a task as part of you know, a larger thing, and the initial agreement of, of the work was you know, X something. And scope creep is in the middle of working on that, someone comes up to you either outside the team or even inside the team and says, yeah, X is great, but we really need X plus a little bit of Y. And you have Y. You're like, yeah, it's only going to be another couple minutes, another hour maybe, so I'll just tack on Y. And then that same person comes back the next day, that's great, now can you give me a little bit of Z? And now you see that suddenly something that was supposed to be defined in scope gets larger and larger. Why is that a bad thing? Deadlines that were being set. Deadlines. Yeah. What? 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 Really? There's. There's one four-letter word for it. Not that four-letter word. There's one four-letter word for it that really is is the problem. Work. It is work. <laughs> it is time. But what is? What is? What is that impact of all the work? The extra work in the end. You know, missing the deadlines is, is one of the, the outcomes. Are. <laughs> risk. Yes. So scope creep is, is part of risk. And so a trait of a good technical leader uh, is going to be um, identifying and managing with some of the risk. And so that's where scope creep comes from. And so um, <clears throat> Again, not a manager, not necessarily a tech lead, just someone on the team that says, hey, there's inherent risk involved. So scope creep is one type of risk. What's another type of risk? To a deliverable project, sprints, whatever. What other risks? Sure. I mean, there's always just not being able to get it done. I don't know if that falls under scope creep. But yeah, I mean, it's it's scope creep may be, yeah, other unknowns. Yeah. So you're in the middle of doing the work, and suddenly the thing that you thought was this big is really this big, right? That's, that's something that's, it's not really scope creep. I mean, it wasn't like someone was asking you to do it. It's just, you know, I have a better understanding of what the scope is now, and it's just a lot larger than what you have. And so that, that's part of it. By the way, this is the whole risk uh, aspect of something that I have to try to solve. Uh, and, and all of that, but it's really the calling out and the identifying of those risks that's that's a good uh, trait of an inspiring leader. So, 
Um, what other types of risk? Hardware. Right. I don't know if this one's the risk that uh, when reforms we ran into was going out of licensing, so it caused huge delays. Certainly, yeah. So there's all kinds of extra team related stuff. So you're writing the code, but if you don't have enough licenses, or if the environment fails, or there's a power outage, or all of these things could happen that could increase risk. Now, there's not a lot of things <laughs> that you can do as a technical leader on a team to really, you know, really impact that directly, um, but uh, there's there's a couple of things that you can, you can be prepared for, like uh, not having enough licenses, what might a good technical leader do to solve that problem? No. Just having to be aware of how much licenses there are. Well, yeah, but it's, it's hard to necessarily know up front that you need to know exactly how many licenses there is of this software and that software. So. When the problem happens, what might a technical leader do? Buy more licenses. Well, buy more licenses, or if you don't have the authority to buy more licenses, go talk to the stakeholder or the person that does, communicate it out, don't let it block you, don't just say, oh, I can't do anything, and just kind of sit there with, you know, on your hands for, for a week at a time or something like that. So in those situations, yeah. Um, power outage is certainly a risk. Um, what is something a good technical leader will do to mitigate the risk of the power outage? Yeah? Execute the data recovery plan. We're happy to have a recovery plan. Data recovery, okay. Um, what does that look like for an everyday developer, though? Well, probably just asking security, hey, we have a power outage. Can you get us back online, please? Sure. Let's just say it's a local power outage to a local dev machine that you have. Let's not assume it's a laptop with a battery. Could be. Say your battery's dead. I don't know. Switch to another machine or request. So you switch to another machine. But what about all the work you were just working on? Uh, you, yes. Um, make sure you have a good video with. Make sure there's a consistent um, understanding that you should be pushing your code to. Like a version something. control system. Having a version control, yes. so if you do lose stuff, at least you have a backup of it. And not just power outages, but what's what's another uh, type of risk that version control solves for? And um, so, yeah, we're all talking about either work not being able to get done because of uh, something that way, or the work being too large. What's the other big piece to this? Not just the code, not just the work itself. Um, people. So what if we have a people outage? Like they're sick. Well, they could do it remotely, but let's say that they're dying and they're not going to be able to do it remotely. And they've been working on something for two weeks. Version control would, would help that. And so making sure that you have a good uh, merge request policy. By the way, what is the best practice for merger, merging code in? What's that? As much as possible. Early and often, yes. So scope creep, risks, things like that. Uh, something that's a little higher level, uh, this one is something that I've personally struggled with um, over the year uh, as a new manager. Um, you want to do multiple things at the same time because I have multiple teams at the same time. And so now what we're really talking about is parallelization of, of things. You want to do multiple things within the team. You want to get to that high performing team. I want to parallelize it. And so I want to make sure that I have the folks and the resources able to do that. How do you parallelize work? How does that even work? How can having a team do two things at once? And I'll say the OKR process in this case. If you know the answer, please. You don't remember? You did this. Yeah. By having two separate code editor windows? You could do that. Certainly, certainly you have two different pieces of delivery. That is absolutely uh, a valid example of parallelization. Uh, we did it a little bit differently. Uh, we did it through something called the OKR process, which is objectively key results. And there's this low cost sprint that we kind of went through and, and um, had, we have this concept of discovery. And discovery is the product manager, a tech lead, product designer coming up with the next thing that we're going to work on to, to affect those objectives and key results. 
So those three folks, plus some others, are off on their own working on the next thing that they're going to be working on, while at the same time, the thing that they discovered on prior, now the delivery team is delivering on, while at the same time, the thing that the delivery team just delivered is going through a hardening cycle, getting ready for production. So there's three phases, all happening at the same time of three things that work. And then now, spread that across five teams and you're managing that. At what point is any one piece of given work about to go to production? So in order to do that, you have to have a well-defined scope. And so when you get to start building out high-performing teams, making sure you have these processes well oiled, making sure you have a lot of the managed expectations and the risk and, and all that process taken care of. Um, generally, if you're doing that though, uh, you're not gonna optimize so much for, uh, there's multiple ways to optimize a team. You can optimize for people efficiency, uh, but generally, in, in this case, you wanna optimize for what they call feature efficiency. So you're gonna optimize based around product teams, which is kind of how we did the program. Yes. So, when is it when is it not possible to parallelize tasks? If you're not a high performing team, right. focus on getting one thing done at a time in the correct way. <laughs> but are there like specific types of tasks or projects that that can, that just cannot be parallelized? Yeah, I mean, there's certain work certainly. Um, so. Okay. Let's talk a little bit. This is one of my favorite topics. I wasn't expecting to put this in this, but this is a great question. Uh, how many of you have heard of the mythical minimum? Great. What is it? Works well. No. When you add people, things go slower. Yes. When you add people, things go slower. So what it actually says is um, if you add uh, resources, people, to a late project so that you can get it done quicker, it's actually going to delay it for so that's actually held true in the 70s as much as it does today. Uh, I literally laugh when I hear in full faith people say, well, it's this thing is late, how many people do we need to add to it to get it done faster? It does not work that way. But um, the way that... Uh, the way that I like to explain works law to people is um, a lot of people will use, you know, a woman can't have uh, a baby and, um, you know, a woman has to have a baby over nine months, nine women can't have one baby in one month type of thing. You can't parallelize that. Um, the better way is I'll buy you the book, The Mythical Man. In fact, I'll buy you two copies of the book so you can read it twice as fast. That's the way I like to do it. So I think that drops the So yeah, there are certain tasks. Um, the way that you go from a newly formed team or a team that's maybe not so high performing is you make sure that you have one thing done correctly, get that process and all the kinks worked out, uh, including people kinks, uh, and then you can start to parallelize it once you find uh, a model that actually works for that team. And it takes a while. Uh, especially for new teams. So, any questions on that before we move forward? So let's say you do have people kinks. Um, let's say you do have folks that you as a technical leader on the team have to deal with other people who are not so good at technical leadership. Do you have any experience with any of these types of people? I feel like this is Everyone's worked with great people and no egos and no issues and no conflict. Never worked with a difficult person besides me. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I, I mean, being a, a co-worker, I hold a lot of problems uh, communicating. Yeah. And it's just really different communication styles and kind of led to a breakdown and slowdown. So, this may surprise you, but folks in the software and computer industry tend to be a little introverted. I know it's crazy, but... <laughs> so, communication is hard for even people who are, you know, used to communicating all the time. Um, or who, people whose job it is to communicate is hard. So, for folks who are 
not apt to speak up or not apt to communicate. Being a good technical leader, a good trait of that person is to uh, help get the, the feedback from your team and, and from the community members or get that, get that communication, uh, whatever it may be. And there's lots of uh, different ways to do that. Um, but really it comes down to being a personal, personal person. But uh, the other side of it, uh, what if you need to give feedback uh, on a person? You ever had to do that? Yeah. Any examples? No. Yeah. A review, code review, anything. Any kind of any kind of feedback. Criticism, but do 
good in a tactful way. Uh, they're never malicious. It's almost always uh, something you know, not having the right understanding or the right alignment of uh, the word that gets thrown around uh, a lot. Um, occasionally, maybe they just are a jerk. Maybe they are doing it maliciously. At that point, if you're not a manager, you're going to have to escalate it to management. If you are a manager and you're reprimanding, then you have appropriate remediation. And they still go beyond it at that point. Well, that's when you have to have a conversation with HR. If you don't have an HR department, then you're probably small enough to just kick them out directly. You know, that sort of thing. If that's what you want to do. Or tell them, if you don't stop, we're going to kick you out uh, type of thing. Luckily, I've never had that situation. It's never went that far. Usually it's just um, setting right expectations, making sure you're self-aware of the feedback. Uh, the, biggest, um, the biggest way that, that I've heard, it's one of my mentors actually uh, has said this multiple times uh, in, in leadership. This is one of those phrases that stuck with me. If someone didn't do what you expected them to do, then turn that back on yourself. Don't blame them for it. What did I not do? What expectations did I not set? Or what tools or what process or what communication did I not give to get the outcome that I expected of that person? That's, I think, the, the most succinct way to, to say that. Question about that? Okay, now you have a highly oiled, uh, well, highly performing team. Everyone's had all their feedback, everything's going great. You're delivering, you're cranking out stuff, the business is used to cranking out stuff, the business is used to having this delivery. And suddenly a date gets pushed up. Oh, we gotta get this out right now. The team says, okay, I'm up for that challenge, and they go and they start doing that. They start working longer hours and they start experiencing burnout. How many of you, hopefully not yet, how many of you have experienced burnout? Probably some senioritis or fourth yearitis. Yeah. So, any what? What's your experiences with that? Anybody? Sure. Come back. Uh, take some time off. Yeah. Take some time off. Kind of hard to do that if you're in crunch time at work. What sort of some other remedies? Um, this isn't exactly work related, but um, uh, we were having a, uh, in our organization, we are having this huge push for um, getting more people to join in, uh, be part of the organization, <coughs> and just taking long hours after everyone. Um, and at some point, it just kind of took us getting all together, kind of having to sit down and just discussing, like, how it's all going, and having, like, a sit down just talking about why is this hard, and how can we make it a little better for you guys. Yeah, like, from my perspective. So if burnout's already occurred with the majority of people on your team, that's actually a, a failure of management or technical leadership. So what's happened is somewhere along the way, something didn't go as planned. Um, um, maybe the deadline, if the team wasn't able to meet a deadline, then either there wasn't enough um, foresight into the risks of, of that, um, basically, there was some mismanagement somewhere up there with the project or expectations. Um, but usually, um, the other big thing that can cause burnout or can lead to burnout is, um, as a technical leader, and this is more on the management side of things, but even as a tech lead, um, there's some some tech but people rise to tech leads because of their ability to uh, get stuff done. That get stuff done attitude is uh, a very type A type of personality, you know, the, the red color type personality. Um, so a lot of times they expect that same thing of themselves. But really, it's never ask more of your team than you would ask of yourself. And so as a manager or as a tech lead, you have to step back and say, Am I willing to work nights and weekends? And the answer should be never. You should never have to do that. If, if you're coming to that, then either you're going to start up and you know 
literally critical do or die. In a large organization, that means you have to manage your risk, you manage your expectations well. So, as a lead, if you say you got to work 60 hours this week, if I'm not personally willing to put in that 60 hours along with them, then you know, then that's going to lead to burnout and and you know the, the over expectation aspect. Yeah. Well, uh, I haven't exactly worked on a team, but I've worked on a contract-based work, and in those scenarios, I feel like burnouts are especially more risky, because if it's contract-based work, they'll just pull off the contract and give it to someone else. Yeah, and certainly that's, that's um, there's, a, there's a lot to unpack in that, because Sometimes, if you're doing client-based contract work like that, um, and there's like an RFP process, or just, hey, I need this done in this amount of time, and someone, your boss or whomever it is, agrees, yep, we can do that, then they're setting the expectation that you can deliver, and if the scope hasn't been fully filled out, they're not protecting you in the scope creep, they're not managing those expectations, and in order to deliver, they're having to, to burn through. So, Really, it, it comes down to the same principle here of um, if you're doing this contract work and you're you're over committing to uh, whoever your client is in this case to beat out someone else. I mean, either they need to be upfront with you about you know this is a 70-hour type of uh, type of work, or they need to push back and have better management of expectations. Now, it's easy to say that, but in the real world, you're going to have um, competition, and maybe you don't get it. If you, if you say, here's my realistic expectation, and then some other job and company comes in, not actually company, not even, but some other uh, company comes in and says, ah, we can do it for cheaper and for, for less and all that. Well, yeah, they're going to go with that person, but they're going to have the folks that are burned out. They're probably going to have the less experienced people, and so there is a certain quality uh, attached to that. Uh, generally, I've heard that called the Iron Triangle. Uh, it's quality, uh, quality, time, and um, cost. Thank you. Well, uh, quality, time, and cost, and you get to pick two. So you can't have all three. It just doesn't exist. Right, so that's what we try to do. We try to talk to our clients and uh, ask for an like extension of some kind, and then we try to sneak in one of those two. Like, like we are working on it because we will provide better quality or better price work compared to competitors. So we try to sneak that in and use that as a sure. motivator to extend to extend the deadline. How are we on time? About time. About time. Uh, two more points, if I'm in. All right, trying to make them quick. Um, you're not going to make everyone happy uh, as a technical leader sometimes. There's going to have to be compromise. And so keep that in mind as you go forward that uh, you're going to have to make decisions at some point in your career in general, not just as a technical leader, as a leader in, in anything. You're never going to be able to make everyone happy. <coughs> Don't try to do it. At the end of the day, you're there for the value of the business or the entity or for some purpose. And you have to put those needs first. Uh, sure, you know, it sucks sometimes uh, having to, to tell someone no or not, not allow everyone to express their way or use their favorite tool or whatever it may be, but, you know, that's part of it and being able to separate the emotion from, from the logic of it is, is an important piece. And then the probably the most important thing, and I like to say, say this for last, it kind of goes back to communication. Um, but it's really, when you're communicating to uh, anyone uh, in a technical way, and you say, we can't do this, or we have to go this way, or this is our vision, or these are all the things, these are all the great things that we're going to do. We're going to build out a new platform for delivery, or we're going to do all these things. None of that's going to matter to the folks on your team if they're not inspired. And the way to inspire them is to explain the why. You have to, to, to you know, show them, explain to them what is the value that you expect to get out of this. 
and getting that alignment, that ownership, the, the ownership of passion, not, not the ownership of, oh, this is my this is my baby and you're calling it ugly type of ownership. I don't mean that type of ownership, but the, I'm invested in in this value or I'm invested in the why. So I really leave on on that point. So make sure to always communicate back to the why. Sorry, I'm a little choppy, but any other questions? Anything else? Yeah. Real quickly, when going back to the thing about version control. Yeah. So on an eight-hour day, how often should you push? Uh, that depends. Um, if you're working on, uh, you know, two different things throughout the day, uh, you're at a, a decent stopping point. Um, you should you should push and merge in when it's when it's ready. But uh, version control allows you to have your own branches. You can push your own branches just for the, the safety of it uh, at, any, at any point. So really, whenever you're at a good stopping point, um, push that up. But I mean, as far as like you can get, the way I do work is I'll write function a module a test. I usually do it like in one of the TDD fashion or something like that. As soon as I have something written, um, I'll usually commit that, a small commit on a branch. And so I may have multiple, sometimes 50 some commits for one branch, and it's just one or two lines of changes each time. Uh, and then when you merge that in, you can squash that into one commit and make it one, one thing. There's, there's lots of tips and tricks and, and things like that you can do. And I wasn't really going into the technicals, right. that, that technical side of it, but there's lots of, of cool best practices and things like that you can do at that level. If you're not in the TDD, you're TDD. Okay.